Good evening, everyone. My name is Suzanne Leal, and on behalf of the Geelong Regional Library Corporation, I'd like you wel to welcome you all to the library's online event with Nikki Gemmel this evening. The Geelong Regional Library Corporation acknowledges the Wadawurrung and Eastern Ma original owners of the lands on which the library services operate. We pay respect to Wadawurrung and Eastern Ma elders past, present and emerging. We acknowledge and celebrate First Nations peoples of this land as the custodians of learning, literacy, knowledge and story. It look like, looks like we're gonna have over 40 people joining us tonight, which is absolutely fantastic. Before I introduce you to the wonderful Nikki Gemmel, a couple of reminders. You can participate in the live webinar, webinar by clicking on the Q&A button and typing your question or comment. You may need to touch your screen with either your mouse or a trackpad to see the Q&A and the chat function, functions if you're using an iPad or iPhone to join us tonight. But if you could please use the Q&A rather than chat, that's gonna make it easier for us to see your questions. Also, this webinar is being recorded. If you'd like to watch the discussion again or recommend it to friends or family, it will be uploaded to the library's YouTube channel within the next couple of days. My name's Suzanne Leal. I'm the author of three novels, The Deceptions, The Teacher's Secret and Border Street. I'm a board member of Bad Sydney Crime Writers Festival and the host of Thursday Book Club, a relaxed way to connect readers online. And tonight I am so very delighted to be here in conversation with Nikki Gemmel. Let me tell you a little bit about Nikki Gemmel, who I'm sure is known to many of you, if not all of you. In fact, she's known as one of Australia's most provocative and honest writers. She's a best-selling author of some 20 books, including Shiver, The Bride Strip Bear, and After. Her latest novel is The Ripping Tree. Her exploration of love and female creativity called Dissolve, another great title, will be published later this year. Nikki writes a popular and again, often controversial column for the Weekend Australian magazine. Her books have been translated into 22 languages and the French literary magazine Lear has included her in a list of its 50 most important writers in the world. What a fabulous list to be on. Hello, hello, Nikki. Now, last time we were together, we were together on stage talking about a, your recent book after and now here we are screen to screen i can't hear you can you unmute yourself nikki um yes you can't hear me i got you got you here you yeah welcome, I, nikki. welcome nikki yeah. i've just been attentively listening thank you for that lovely lovely introduction suzanne and it is so lovely to be here tonight with all of you how about this book, Nikki? This book, The Ripping Tree, which has the most beautiful cover. Can you just pop it up so the readers can see? It's got the most gorgeous cover, which really matches the lushness of its prose. But tell me this, Nikki, what exactly is a ripping tree? <laughs> well, if you look at this cover, it looks like the smouldering bark of a tree but it's actually the genius designer, Darren Holt, and I squealed when I saw this cover and I don't always squeal when I see the covers of my books. But when I saw this one appear on my computer screen, I was just like, oh, this is perfect. Basically, he created this during the, those long weeks of lockdown last year and he wanted to recreate the bark of a tree. And he basically took strips of beautiful, beautiful art paper dipped them in ink mm. and then kind of stuck them all together so it looked like a tree that's smoldering from within which is very apt for the book and um if I can just quickly explain the title 10 years ago I moved from London I'd been living in London for 15 years moved back to Australia moved home but I transported with me three little pommies who were my young kids. And one of them, my daughter, Thea, she was only like four years old when we arrived in Australia. And she looked at all these trees around her that she'd never seen before. And she said, look, mummy, look at the ripping trees. And as soon as she said that, I thought, oh, you know, I'm such a, a magpie, a bowerbird in terms of a novelist. That is a great 
title and I want to steal it. So basically for the last 10 years, Thea and I have had this conversation about how much money I have to give her for this title. Um, and can any of you guess what a four-year-old would have been talking about when she was talking about a ripping tree? I don't know if you want to say it in the comments. I can't see. But it's a tree that's got long tongues of bark that for a kid is kind of delectable and they just want to peel away the bark. Can I say? Can I say? Yes, yes you can say. Is it, Nikki, is it a paper bark tree? Yes, yes, yes it is. You in a copy book. I get so excited with these competitions because I don't <laughs> win many competitions. And it just occurred to me, I'm the only one with the mic apart from you. So it looks like I'm going to be the winner. <laughs> well, there you go. And so the, the, the metaphor of the paper bark and peeling away the layers and this mm. core, this hidden core of the tree and, and kind of the truth behind many, many layers and secrets, that is all very apt for the book. That's an excellent metaphor for describing what happens in this book. What I want to do now is just set the scene for our readers at home. It's hot off the presses, your book. So I'm imagining a lot of people that are listening tonight haven't had a chance to read or listen to it on audiobook yet. So let's just um, go a little bit back to basics. We're in colonial Australia. It's the early 1800s. A ship is coming from England to Australia and it's been shipwrecked. So very many lives have been lost, but one has been saved, that of Thomasina Trelora. How did Thomasina come to be on this shipwrecked ship? <laughs> well, she is my feisty young protagonist. I was inspired by uh, wonderful Australian novels I'd read through my teenage years and my 20s. She's a bit of a Sibylla from My Brilliant Career. She's a bit of a Juju, Judy, from Seven Little Australians. She's clumsy and tough and tomboyish and stubborn and sparky and strong. Poor old Thomasina is being sent to Australia to be married off to a vicar. Her older brother, she's, she's been orphaned and her older brother decides this is the best fate for her. And because she's so stubborn and headstrong and thinking, she tries to thwart her fate. And when she's shipwrecked, she sees it as an opportunity. And what I was thinking of, I'm, I'm clutching it as a security blanket. It helps me to think for some reason. What I was thinking of as I was creating my glorious Tom um, was Viola in Twelfth Night, a stranger in a strange land, a young woman who's washed up on a strange island she's never been to before. She doesn't know what it is, doesn't know what it means, but she seizes the opportunity for reinvention. And so Tom is taken by a, an in, Indigenous man to this illustrious house on the coast in the middle of nowhere. And she's like, yes, I've made it. This is a fantastic opportunity to be among these people, to be among this family um, and reinvent. You know, she, she wants to change who she is. She doesn't want to be married to the vicar. She wants to dress in a different way. She, in fact, wants to be who she really wants to be. And for a lot of us as young women, even now, um, you know, this Edith Wharton talked about a curtain of niceness that falls over us as young women. We lose our confidence. We kind of push away that person who we really actually want to be and kind of this curtain of meekness and quietness, this lack of confidence can fall over us. Well, Tom, when she arrives at this strange place, just wants to sweep away the curtain and be exactly who she wants to be. But it doesn't all go, go according to plan. You've made mention of the illustrious house that she comes to. And this house is called Willow Bray, which in itself could almost have been the title of the book, because really it is very much the story of a house and its contents and its yes. people. Thank you for picking up. Sorry, keep on going. <laughs> No, no. Um, Willow Braid's a beautiful name and it's really evocative. And I could actually, even with the name alone, I could see this house in front of me. Who's inside that house when Tom <laughs> lands on the doorstep? Well, in terms of who's inside it, I, I will just quickly say Willow Bray. I wanted to create 
a book around an iconic house, you know, in terms of Manderley and Rebecca, mm. um, Wuthering Heights, you know, these houses that are central to a story, these estates, um, even Privet Drive, you know, central to Harry Potter. Um, so I wanted a memorable house. I initially gave it an Indigenous name, like so many, you know, beautiful houses are given in Australia or stations or country properties. And my editor said, you know, the people who are living in this place, they'd be harking back to where they came from. Give it a good, strong Scottish name. So basically I Googled, you know, various Scottish names and sayings and all the rest of it, came up with Willowbray. So this family, they're very kind of sternly Protestant, sternly biblical. I was thinking a little bit of the people in, in the film, Breaking the Waves, um, very kind of rigid with their Christianity, firm and stern. They're very illustrious within the neighbourhood, but they live very isolated lives. And because they live these isolated lives, they've, they've got impunity in a way to do what they want to do. So they've developed this very kind of um, dubious way of making money and um, basically uh, my, my lovely Tom, she crashes into this world, all wide-eyed innocence, a thousand questions. And she gradually realises over the course of seven days, it's, it's a psychological thriller, so it's meant to like just, you know, you're meant to gallop through it and find out what's going on, what's happening here. Um, so Poss gradually comes to realise that what she thinks is saving her, i.e. this family, the Craw family, is not saving her after all. And I must admit, as a writer, I had a ball um, coming up with a strap line. I came up with about 30 of them. It's like, oh, my God, I could have a new profession of basically writing film strap lines. So um, the, the strap line that the publishers chose was get out before they save you. And in terms of that, I was thinking of, I don't know if any of you have seen the film Get Out, which is literally about a stranger in a strange land again, a man who goes to his girlfriend's house, meets the girlfriend's family, gradually realises that his life is in danger as he stays at this place. Mm. This is what happens with Tom, Thomasina. It's like a spider's web is gradually being woven around her until it's like, oh, my goodness, can she escape? Can she get out of this? She should be stopping all her questions. She's got a very strong voice and she hasn't been taught to be silent and meek. She's passionate about unfairness and if she sees unfairness, she wants to voice it. So that's basically the premise of the novel. Very, in a very long way, long-winded way. <laughs> Sorry, Suzanne. You've talked about Tom being caught in the spider's web there's more than one spider potentially within the craw family but the first one perhaps and we never know who's good who's bad not for a long time but the first person for whom i had some disquiet was mrs craw tell me about mrs craw yes. So basically, she's the matriarch, the very firm, strong, diminutive, but firm and strong and very powerful within the family. Mrs. Craw has three sons. She also had a daughter who was lost at a very young age on the property. So Mrs. Craw, she sees this beautiful Australian bush all around her through um, Scottish eyes, through stern Scottish eyes. And I must admit, when I came back from London, I also saw, a stranger, uh, saw Australia through a stranger's eyes in a way, because I'd been away for so long. And I'd heard for years British people say, oh, it's so ugly and, and it's so spiky and, and it's all yellow, all the grass. And, and it was like, I could see where they were coming from. So I wanted to write a character who does not respond to the Australian bush at all, yearns for a daughter, yearns for a free female presence in her life because she lives a, a man's world, three sons, a husband, convict staff, that kind of thing. She wants a woman beside her. When she sees young Poss, 
she thinks, ah, I've got my daughter. I've got a little dolly I can dress up in silks and lace and all the rest of it, which is the furthest thing from, Poss's, from Tom's mind. So basically there's a clash of wills almost right from the start. And Mrs. Craw realises pretty quickly that Tom is quite untamable, and that creates a lot of tension between the two females. This is a book about names, names you have, names you give away, names you take on yourself. Mm -hmm. Tom is also Poss. How does Tom become Poss and why? <laughs> Well, Tom, Thomasina, her real name is Thomasina, at home with a beloved father. She was raised by her dad. Her mum had passed away when she was very young. So she was always known as Tommy Tom by her dad, Tom. So Tomboy's name. Um, but when she comes to Willowbray, she decides she doesn't want anyone to know her real name because that might connect her to the vicar who's somewhere in the colony that she's meant to be marrying. So she allows... A young boy, a seven-year-old boy, the youngest of the Craw sons, who she kind of develops a lovely relationship with, a little bit like an Enid Blyton adventure type of relationship with him. She allows him to name her and he calls her Poss, short for Possum, and he calls himself Mouse. So they have this lovely relationship. But once again, as the story unfolds, you think, something's not quite right here and I was trying to convey in a way the unease of something like um a turn of the screw Henry James's a turn of the screw as you're reading that that short sharp shiver of a novel where you think what is that woman seeing is she mad is she absolutely rational what is going on so I wanted to create a little bit of that kind of unease with this book too Nikki, have you been reading the questions in front of me? <laughs> of course, no. Jake, Jake Lend Lenders has said, how did James's turn of the screw influence the ripping tree? Oh, my God. Like, yes. Was that from Jack? From Jake. Jake. Thank you, Jake. That is wonderful. And I must admit, this has taken me 10 years to read this book. Through those 10 years, I've had two boys go through high school English and as they were reading, you know, wonderful tomes like A Turn of the Screw and A Heart of Darkness, I was going back and because they were just lying around and maybe those boys weren't reading them the way they should have been reading them, but I was picking them up and reading them and just being so transported by the power of narrative. Both those books are very small and I must admit with all my novels I dream of like this 100 page, 120 page, short sharp shock of a thing and that's in a way I'd say Turn of the Screw was my tuning fork in terms of um, disquieting the reader. I love that idea of you don't know what is really going on there and then you get to the last page and you go oh, it's it's such a shock and it stays with you the power of that narrative and the way you almost enter into the the protagonist the woman's brain um I wanted something similar to that and in terms of entering into the mind of the protagonist I must admit for me I played around with voice and tense a lot over the 10 years I tried to write this book in the second person, which is what I'd written The Bride Strip Bear in and a few of my novels. And I'd felt very comfortable with second person. It, it's, it's a hard one to pull off, but I found a groove for me in terms of, I loved the distance it creates, but also the sense of intimacy that you're invading someone's mind. You're really hearing what they think. So it's like, you did this, you did that. With The Ripping Tree, it just didn't work. It was too tricksy in terms of a narrative device. So I went back to The Turn of the Screw and I really examined how James had presented this as a story. And um, he basically began with a group of people, sat around a fire, and basically, you know, the pretense was that they were hearing a story a ghost story, even though there's no ghost stories in mine. But I loved that framing device. And so that gave me the idea of doing a forward and an afterward for the ripping tree, where someone is basically reading a diary. 
that's been kept in the family for decades. No one knows about it, but it's an, a story that is suddenly unearthed. And because I decided on the diary form, it had to be in the first person. And once I flicked from second person to first person, I did this, I did that, what's happening here, I don't understand, that kind of thing, the story just came very strongly and it flowed. So that was a process over several years of trying to find that form to write the novel in. And it was the turn of the screw that really kind of, as I said, was my tuning fork for that. So I hope that's answered your question, Jake. Nikki, I think it's time to do a reading from this book. Sure. I mean, now that we know that it's how it started in the second per person, how it came to the first person, I'd really like to hear uh, everyone at, at home or wherever you are on screen, the prose, listen to the prose, it's lush, it's captivating, it's shocking sometimes, the turn of phrase is unusual and I was completely grabbed. Oh. Over to you, Nikki Gemmell. Aren't you lovely, Suzanne? And I must apologise because I'm now, now I'm trying to find my glasses. Oh, here they are. And they're big, thick, thick coat bottle ones. I'm sorry, I'm now creating a barrier here um, between all of you, but I need them to read. And I must admit, whenever I do a reading... I'm always editing as I go. It's always like, oh, I shouldn't have done that or there's repetition there or too many adjectives. And so I usually do readings with a pen and I'm actually like, you know, changing it as I go. But I'll try not to do that this time. Okay. This is a chapter called Wilting. It's near the start of the book. It's Poss. And it's Mrs. Craw, who I was telling you about, the woman who really wants a daughter. The woman leads me to the bed, and at the strength in the encircling arms, I wilt. The ocean is back through me, and I sway and fall to the sheet, like a mole wanting to tunnel into its home. Home, so removed from all this. She's from England, I should say. Oh, look, now I'm just going to explain the whole thing all the way through. Sorry. When I depart this world, I want my body slipped into the sweet, wild earth of my unbound girlhood, my balming earth. But I fear I'll never get back to it now. This is my only certainty here, that I'll never again sleep in the home that holds my heart hostage my little teapot of a cottage with its snug windows of warped glass and sooty candle nooks and narrow stairs to my attic lair. I used to go and stay in a little holiday house in Gloucestershire, just like this one with its little stairs. So that's what I was thinking of as I was describing this. Um, I'd always leap over the bottom five in my race to clatter into the day. I nestle on this new bed now, want to weep. With my father, I was exactly the person I wanted to be. I was found. And now I need some kind of ballast. I am lost. So it's all these ship metaphors because she's just been shipwrecked. Sorry if I'm explaining too much. Just write in the comments and I'll shut up with that bit. <laughs> Name, age, 16. A softening voice. I think there's still something of the child in you, yes? You do look very young, poor pot, what you've been through. My hair is smoothed behind an ear and smoothed and I nudge into the sudden tenderness like a dog wanting a pat. Um, Tom is motherless, so she really craves female affection. The woman's fingers hold my head firm on either side and find both temples and rub in a circular motion and I shut my eyes and surrender to the authoritative feminine touch that's melting away my headache. My mother died of a lung disorder when I was four and all she left me with was a craving for a fingertip slowness down a cheek and a fierce female holding where everything is soothed right. My father left me with the memory of freedom in a life flavoured by the earth. He didn't want his girl in corsets that restricted her breathing or skirts without the convenience of pockets. He wanted my hands ready for the world. You must have po pockets for your fossils and sticks to collect the world, Tommy Tom. 
And as you can see, this is my desk behind me, which is full of things that I collect from the world. I'm a big collector. And now an unreadable woman fusses around me. Her hands straighten the bedclothes and rearrange items on the bureau and tuck Jack's knife under the Bible as if she's sullied by the sight of it. Then she goes to the curtains and completely shuts out the light. What dreams, child? Pardon? This morning, you were crying and calling out, clawing at the air to be saved. The manny minds madness in restless sleep. Oh, I've no memory of it, goodness. I'll have to watch for any signs of slippage. After my father's death, my brother had one thing over me when it came to stubbornness and strop. He threatened to have me locked up in the county women's asylum more than once. And as my legal guardian, he could have done it. I did a lot of research on women's asylums back in, the, in those days. That look, Thomasina, it's too much. Would you care for the asylum, perhaps? Would you? It can be arranged. Just try me. Go on. I always knew that a charge of insubordination or willfulness was enough to have me banished. Women around me had been swallowed by less. Beth Tyne for being a grass widow. Although why she should have been punished when her husband was the one who got bored and ran off, I don't know, leaving her to look after two small children. Mary Harris for rebellion against domesticity. These were all crimes that women um, were put into an, a county asylum for. M. Snow for fret sickness when her baby came. Petty Rattle for fret sickness when her baby didn't come. Ada Wilton, hysteria. Kara Larkin, hysteria. And what exactly did that word mean? My brother's solution to the vexed matter of my existence lay in a parish in the colonies, regrettably far from his own estate, but close enough to occasionally keep an eye on me. I could never be left in my hometown completely alone unwatched and penniless. Ambrose had burdened our father's house with debt to fund his new life in the new world. And now there's no family money left. And I was not allowed to be left behind to become the village eccentric in her perplexing boy clothes. But what Ambrose doesn't know is that I'll only marry for love and want. And that decision will remain sacrosanct. There's also a, a lovely, lovely love story in here too, but I can't really say that because that's a spoiler thing anyway. Sorry for all the interjections, but that's it. <laughs> and that was the annotated reading of The uh, Ripping Tree by Nikki Gemmell. Whether you want it or not. <laughs> <laughs> Very early in the book, Poss is working, walking in the bush with Mouse when she stumbles across a site that sends her, and quite frankly us, reeling. From there unfolds a story of the darkness of our colonial history. My question for you is this, did you hesitate to write a story that grapples with this history, particularly as it impacted Indigenous people? No, I didn't hesitate at all. I, I wanted to grapple with this. Um, I, I said earlier that um, Poss Tom, her passion is fairness and it's my passion too. Um, I'm passionate about fairness. I always have been. My second novel, Cleave, which was flashed up on the screen earlier on that the Geelong Library very kindly has, it, it was set in an Aboriginal community in Central Australia. That was my second novel. Way back then, that was written like 25 years ago, I was passionate about unfairness then. And I always have been. And in a way, I've revisited this in a colonial setting because I wanted someone who was an innocent in this world but was also articulate and could articulate the unfairness at the core of this family and this world. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's all based in research. It's shocking, the secret, the layers of secrets that Tom uncovers. It's brutal. It might be hard to read for some people, but um, 
I didn't want to shy away from that. And I, 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 I had um, a wonderful Indigenous academic from the um, University of Newcastle, the Indigenous Studies Centre there, John Maynard. I, I don't know if we want to talk. Yes, more please. About that. Yes. Um, he did a reading. We had a back and forth email conversation about the book over a whole year. There were things that he wanted taken out. Some things like, for instance, I had a bull roarer in there. I had a child, a male child touching it. He said, you know, that that would not happen with a bull roarer. So I was like, thank you for telling me, took those kind of things out. He helped me with Indigenous names, bits and pieces. What he did not want touched, what he wanted absolutely kept in there was um, the horror at the heart of the book. And I think that was a real affirmation for me as a writer to say yes these things need to be spoken of we need to confront the darkness at the heart of our settler years our colonial world I would never as a writer dare to write from an Indigenous perspective I don't think that's my place I wouldn't tread on anyone's toes and I want um, I want to hear the in Indigenous voices in terms of that and that perspective. So yes, I do weave through an Indigenous story, but it's always seen through Poss's eyes, not from the Indigenous perspective. You've said the aim in writing, as always, is not to flinch from difficult truths, to lure, then provoke. Not to flinch. Can this be difficult when you're writing? Yes, I mean, I, I did think as I was writing this, you know, am I going too far? Am I going too far? But what I was writing about, there are oral, oral records of this happening. Um, and, you know, my, my book is wrapped in the glossy package of a psychological thriller. Um, but it, it also deals with confronting things. And in terms of a writer who writes to disturb or unsettle in a way, I always have. I've always been, in a sense, a political writer, you know, in terms of Cleve set in a, a contemporary Indigenous community. That, to me, was a political novel 25 years ago. The Bride Strip Bear was a political novel in terms of female sexuality. Um, you know, after my memoir about my mother who euthanized herself and um, suicided through um, doing a lot of research around Philip Nitschke, that was a political book too. So I feel like this is just another thing I'm passionately interested in that I wanted to explore within the package of a galloping thriller narrative. And where did the inspiration for the story come from? <laughs> many, many things. Um, basically, I was, you know, um, about 2009, 2010, I was getting really, really homesick in London. I'd lived there for 15 years. The English summers were always a perpetual disappointment as I just craved those tall blue, you know, skies and the Australian light in my bones. And the homesickness actually increased rather than decreased over the years. And so at about, I think it was the end of 2010, it was like a drippy, dreary December day in London. I tripped into my agent's office, the wonderful David Godwin, he was in Covent Garden then. And I just said to him, Godwin, I just want to go home. I'm so homesick. And he said to me, well, just go home, Gemmel. You've been saying that for years. Just good riddance. Um, go home and write an Australian novel this time. Because I must admit, I'd, I'd had a series of British novels that I'd love song, The Bride Strip Bear, The Book of Rapture. They were all British set. And I just felt like I want to go home and immerse myself in the Australian bush the Australian light, the Australian ocean, you know, it is so different to my London world. I was craving it. So in a way, moving back home, transplanting my three little pommies and my, um, my Aussie husband, who was a little bit more reluctant to come home than me, um, 
but writing a book was my excuse as much as anything else. So the inspiration was immerse myself back in the land, um, write a story. I must admit, I was also inspired by the wreck of the Dunbar, which is a shipwreck that happened um, off Sydney Heads. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a terrible, terrible, tragic wreck. The loss of, I think it was 150 odd souls on board, except for one person who could swim and ended up washed up on the rocks and was rescued. So I did a lot of research into that shipwreck as well. So that was the start of the novel. But then over 10 years, you know, I traveled down to Northwest Tasmania, found the perfect house for a Willabray down there. I traveled to um, Secret River country, um, St Albans, you know, north of the Hawkesbury River, did research there, convict land, uh, and up to Port Macquarie. There was a jail up there um, and a wonderful church, which, um, which has still, like, the knuckles of convicts embedded in the bricks of the church. It's just fantastic. So that became the inspiration for a church in the book. A little bush church. Um, so over 10 years, there were many, many inspirations for the novel. I'm interested in your going to Tasmania to find Willow Bray. Did yes. you just have a hunch it might be there? Did you stumble on it? Did you know it might be there? No, I didn't know at all. Um, oh, sorry. I'm just, my, my dubious lighting setup, which is resting on a pillow, is now collapsing. Um, no, no, no. I was sent down there to interview Bob Brown, actually. And, and that was glorious in itself. And then I had a couple of days afterwards. And so I was fascinated about convict areas. I had a hire car and I very quickly read about this. Oh gosh, I wish I could remember the name of it. You can go and visit it. It's like a national trust house. Um, and it looks like almost an antebellum mansion from the American deep south. It's in the northwest of Tasmania. It's glorious. Um, and as soon as I visited it, and it's got convict outhouses. I also went to Stanley. There's another wonderful, um, beautiful old homestead with the remains of an old convict barracks um, next to it. So there's quite a few places in Tasmania, not that I want to say it's set, in Tasmania, and I was very deliberate about that. I, it, it could be, you know, off the coast of New South Wales. It could be Victoria off the coast. It could be somewhere in Tasmania. I just wanted to keep that vague. I didn't want to have um, a specific place for where these events had happened. Nikki, this is a book of difficult men, but also very impressive men, including Poss's late father, Yes. who really is her moral compass. Mm -hmm. Now, my late father was my moral compass, and, and I think even in his death has remained that. And I identified very much with uh, Poss's love for her father. The Ripping Tree, I notice, is dedicated to your late father. And I'm just wondering if aspects of your dad found their way into any of the characters. <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'd never really written about just an uncomplicated, non-judgmental love between a father and a daughter, which I was blessed to have too, Suzanne. I think we are both so lucky to have had these beautiful men in our lives who've taught us so much. My dad, um, he never read any of my books. Basically, I, I, I said to him in my early 20s, oh, Dad, I want to be a novelist. And he just went to me, old coal miner, you know, he'd left school at 16, books weren't really his world. And he just went to me, oh, waste of time, that. Mm -hmm. um, and that was his attitude to writing. You know, he was, he was hardworking stock. So he thought writing was something flippity-jibbity, um, you know, not a proper life, not a proper working world. So he just didn't get it. Um, and, and when I had Shiva, my first novel published when I was 30, I gave him a copy of it and he opened it up with great excitement. <laughs> he read the first page. I can't even remember what word it was, but he didn't like it. It might have been a swear word or I can't remember. But anyway, he shut the book, never read anything of mine again, just did not want to engage with my writing life 
at all. And that didn't matter because that was daddy and, and you know, he just, he, he, he gave me love in so many other places. So it didn't matter. But when I came to write The Ripping Tree, I actually thought, you know, this is his kind of book. He loves a thriller. He, lo he loves, you know, just a ripping read or that kind of thing. And I reckon this would have been the first book that he would have read. He, he died um, in December last year. He, um, he'd been a coal miner for almost 60 years and he had a um, black clot uh, cancerous on his lung, his right lung, um, and um, very quickly he he went so I dedicated the book to him and I'm so glad that I wrote this beautiful beautiful character of the father in the book there's also another wonderful character I can't say too much but it's the love story it's someone who Tom falls in love with in the book um, and I feel like there's a whole other story to that situation too but that's another wonderful wonderful deeply thinking tender and generous man I didn't want all the men in the book to be you know dubious and awful and they're certainly not we've got about 20 minutes to go so just a warning for our audience any questions now's the time to start posting them just uh, I've got a couple more questions for uh, Nikki and then I'll try not to uh, monopolize her all night and hand over to questions in the Q&A function on the webinar. My question now, Nikki, goes to structure. And you've talked a little bit about the changes you made. You started in the second person, moved to the first person, and then made it a diarised book. Mm -hmm. So it's set over seven days. How did, you, how did you manage to get that shape? There's a lot of story to get within those seven days. Was that a difficult structure to wrangle? Yes, it was so hard. <laughs> um, and I must admit, my, my menopausal brain found it much harder to keep a hold of this really kind of, you know, there were so many strands to the story. So I wrote this book over 10 years. In that time, um, my mother died. I wrote the book after. I wrote a few children's books. I'd, I'd started a weekly column with the Weekend Australian magazine and that crashed into my thinking every week because that takes a lot of mental energy away from my novel writing. And what I found with particularly around the time of after, that was like 2016, 2017, I had put the ripping tree aside and then I had to dive back into it. And because I'm older now than when I wrote my first novel, Shiver and Cleave, which were like so present and so there, I had to go back and reread the manuscript before I could actually start writing and working on it again because it was so hard to keep the strands of the story in my head and to make it all flow. And I must tip my hat to uh, two wonderful editors at Harper Collins here, um, Anna Valdinger and Catherine Milne, because they kept me on the right path. And that was fantastic. Um, one of them took over when, um, Catherine took over when Anna went on maternity leave. So basically it was great for me because I had two wonderfully professional eyes over the manuscript saying Nikki that strand doesn't quite work it doesn't quite tie together or crucially for me you know this section of the book is slow get rid of it that kind of thing I'm someone who loves a good rigorous edit I welcome it in fact with one of my novels Cleve back in the day I sent it back because the first edit I had on that was just, I could tell too light, too respectful, too timid in a way. And I just sent it back to my publisher and said, can I, can I just get someone tougher and more brutal on this? Cause I know it can be a better book. And um, that's how I've always been with editors. So that's one of the reasons why The Ripping Tree has taken so long, 10 years is because I wrote it in a very disjointed way and also uh, there was a lot of editing which I was very grateful for because I just wanted it tight and kind of um, a real kind of 
bullet train of a book. And so I was very happy to rip and slash. But I think that's my journalism background in me too. I began in um, radio journalism at the ABC as a cadet. And we were taught, you know, almost from day one, don't be precious about your work um, because, you know, editors are going to rip and slash and cut it to fit into a certain amount of time or whatever. So I've always... Um, been very happy to kill my darlings basically in terms of the editing process. I have to echo what you're saying about the value of an editor. I've come later to publishing than you but I must say with those the first manuscripts to have someone paid to pour over your imaginary world to make that imaginary world better mm. is um is quite an honor I think and um and it in something that is very alone for a long time, to share it with someone who has your welfare and the welfare of the book at heart mm. is really quite excellent. Is that the relationship that you find that you have with your publisher, with your editor? Yes, absolutely. I feel like it's such a gift. I feel like these extraordinary women, they're so generous in terms of, you know, the care they take. With, with your work, I just feel so extraordinarily grateful for that. And I, you know, there are some writers who don't want to edit. I could name them, but I won't. Um, but, you know, they, they feel like their work is, is complete and precious as it is, and they don't want anyone touching it and mucking around with it. Whereas for me, I feel like my work always benefits from another eye. And I will say my agent is, is a great editor too. He began as, a, as an editor and switched across. I mean, yeah, switched across to being an agent. And for him, often what I will do with almost all my novels, I will give him my books he will then go through them and then back in the day when I lived in London, he'd call me into his office and give me, you know, several pages of notes, including things like that ending doesn't quite work, you know, change the protagonist, you know, really big meaty things. And he would say, you know, I want this to be the best book it can be because I only get one opportunity to give it to a publisher. They're not going to look at my book again if they've rejected it once. So he wants to get it in as good a shape as he can before he sends it out. And he's someone that I can trust. I will say that in terms of editors, agents, readers, if there are any re uh, writers out there or, or beginner writers, you really have to find your champion and someone who you trust because I've also done creative writing um, at an undergraduate and a graduate level at uni and, you know, I've seen uh, young fledgling writers, their confidence destroyed by careless mentors, careless people and writing is all about confidence and we are such fragile beasts and I think you have to be very careful to find someone who is, yes, going to give you constructive criticism, but is also going to boost your confidence in a way that is, they're not going to crush you because I've seen that happen with some wonderful, wonderful writers. They just find it's too hard, it's too exposing, and my heart breaks for them. You say that writers are often very fragile. I would also say that to be a writer, you also need within that fragility to have a strength because I don't know about you, Nikki, but it seems to me and for a lot of people around me, it's a profession of resilience. It's a profession of coming back and back and back. So maybe it's a profession of, um, of addiction that you need to be there and, and you keep coming back. Doesn't matter what the stakes are, what the money, what the time it takes. Is that a strength or is that something darker? Is that the disease? What do you think? You know, I look at actors and, and I think, wow, their life is rejection upon rejection upon rejection. But that's the life of a writer too. I wrote a, a, a YA novel during lockdown, was rejected. So, you know, I still get rejections and you have to learn not to be precious about that and just pick yourself up, dust yourself off and keep on going. It is bloody hard. Mm -hmm being a writer you know I look at Elena Ferranti and I think wow she's got the perfect scenario you know she's got her pseudonym she can just put out her books she doesn't have to you know be the face of them which can be terrifying you know with the ripping tree I honestly thought I don't know what I've written here I don't know if it's worked I don't know if it's a failure I don't know what this book is 
that I've done. And I had that feeling until the day it was published and then reviews started coming in and it was like, oh, my God, people, there are people out there that actually get it, that actually understand what I was trying to do. And I, until that moment, I had, I just didn't know that anyone would get that. Um, so that's how insecure I am about my own writing. Um, and I look at Elena Ferranti and I think, wow, she's so lucky. She can just sail on, you know, her books come out. She's not whoever she is. You know, there's been a lot of speculation, but it's just like she doesn't have to be the public face of that. And I think that must be incredibly liberating and freeing for a writer. Virginia Woolf said, um, anonymity is a refuge for women writers. And, you know, I've tried the anonymous thing and <laughs> when I was anonymous, it was yes. the most extraordinary refuge and incredibly liberating to be totally honest. So, um, yeah, writing is a tough game and I wouldn't go in it unless you're able to deal with rejection after rejection. <laughs> And that segues nicely into the question we have um, from someone who hasn't given their name, but it is in fact, what advice would you give to beginner writers? Well, I would say just keep on writing. Um, for me, I didn't publish my first novel until I was 30, but I've known from about the age of 18 that I wanted to be a writer. So I had a 12 year apprenticeship. What I did was I um, started writing short stories and I'd always heard back in the day that, you know, you send your short story off to one literary magazine and then you wait for the rejection. It's all very polite. And then you send it off to another. I was like, bugger that. I am going to send this short story off to every single literary magazine I can think of. And, you know, back in the day, that was Mianjin and Southerly and Westerly and Overland, all those magazines. There's a lot more now, actually. There's a wider forum for it. Quadrant was another one. And so I basically just did multiple copies of my work, sent them off everywhere. I called it saturation bombardment. And then, you know, out of 10 rejections, Gradually, I, I would start getting a trickle of like one. One person somewhere would be my champion, would be my reader who responds. And I must admit for me, you know, what some people love, other people absolutely hate. I was lucky that one of my first champions was Les Murray, oh. who, took one of, who took my first story. And to have that, I've still got the postcard somewhere up here on, the, on my window. Um, you know, to have that acceptance from someone like him, so warm and so generous, that was the rocket fuel of confidence that I needed to get me through the next decade of multiple rejections in a way. And then when I wrote Shiva, my first book, I thought, this is it, this is the dream. I've always wanted to have a novel published by the time I'm 30. I sent it off to a Sydney literary agent. She rejected it. She said it was unpublishable. And I was gutted. I'd had this 10, 12 year apprenticeship and I thought, that's it. That's the dream. It's gone. It's gone. I'm, I'm, I'm not cut out to be a writer. I, I'll never have a novel, novel published. I just have to let the dream go. I was working at Triple J at the time. I was a newsreader there. Some people still remember me as just a Triple J newsreader and they don't even realise that I've had a whole career as a writer, but that's by the by. <laughs> anyway, so I was, um, I was reading the news opposite Mikey and Helen one morning on Triple J and I got to the end of the bulletin and Mikey put on a song. It was like 6am, 6.05, whatever it was in the morning. And Helen just looked at me and she said, you don't want to do this, do you? And I went, it's funny you say that, Helen. No. And she said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to be a writer. I want to have a novel published and I've actually written a novel and it's been rejected. An agent rejected it. And Helen said, right. This amazing Helen Razor who gave me this beautiful act of generosity. She said, I just had a nonfiction book published at Vintage by this amazing publisher called Jane Paul Freeman. Oh. She said, you send her the manuscript of your novel and just say, I sent you. And so, you know, I was very lucky I had that in with Jane, but I had to prove to her that it was a book that could be published. I sent it along to her. 
I didn't have an agent because I'd been rejected by an agent. Um, she took Shiva within 24 hours. And that made me realise that what one person hates, mm. another person is going to love. You just have to find that person. And it might take you going through 10 or 20 people who reject your work or 30 or 100, whatever. But you have to find your champion. So after Jane took Shiva, that was it. I was on my way. Um, and I'm so grateful for Helen Razor basically saying, just, just send it to her. And don't be disheartened if an agent has rejected your work. So I would say keep on going. Persistence and tenacity and grit and hunger and discipline are what this profession is about so much more than talent. Um, you've just got to persist, basically. And good luck. Thank you, Nikki. We have a second question from Jake Lenders. And his question is, do you believe people should write with the intention of getting published or do we assume that all writing gets published? Now, there's an awful lot of writing that doesn't get published. Um, that's an interesting question and one that I've never actually been asked before in all my years of being asked questions as a writer. I certainly write with the intention of being published and I always had from those early days of short stories when I was writing them aged 18 or 19 or 20, I wasn't just doing them for myself. I was doing them to eventually have them placed somewhere. And some of them got placed, some of them didn't. But I guess because I was always aware I wanted them to appear somewhere, I would redraft and redraft, um, you know, sometimes 10, 20 times. My third novel, Love Song, went to 60 drafts. So I'm, I'm, I'm a great one for going back and revisiting a text to polish it in a way that will make it publishable. But saying that, you know, other people write in diaries or journals, you know, never intending their work to see the light of day that anyone should read their work. And I think that kind of writing is very valuable too. Often in times of great trauma in my life, um, I've turned to my journals. I've, I'm up to about journal number 37 now. I've been writing in them since I was 14. Mm. And they're just, you know, very private thoughts that are in there. But they're also writer's notebooks. Um, you know, I jot down conversation scraps and title ideas and description of a sunset or whatever it is that might be threaded through a narrative 10 or 15 years later. So those journals are just for me, but they're my workbooks that I go back to again and again. And I do think that's excellent advice. If there's something I wish I'd done, it would have been to have kept a journal from the time that I could write and kept it rigorously because um, it's, it's your history. Yes, exactly. And also for me, in terms of posh, she's a, a, a Tom, my protagonist in The Ripping Tree, she's a 16 year old girl. And I thought, how can I just capture again that energy and that spark of being so young and so alive? Because I'm old and jaded now, basically. And I went back to my journals when I was 14, 15, 16. And, you know, they were, they were written in like the 1980s. But um, just the, they captured the tone of what it was like to be young and so alive and so passionate about everything. Um, so they were handy for me in, in that respect too. I know a French author, Marie Dariussec, also used journals for her book Clev or All the Way in English. And mm -hmm. um, and you really and, and the, the energy bounces off the pages. Yeah, right, right. Guess what, Nikki? What? It's Although it's almost 8.30. So no! <laughs> I'm, I'm going to wrap up and um, give you a chance to say goodbye to everybody before I conclude on behalf of the libraries and myself. Oh, look, thank you so much, everyone. I've had a ball tonight. Suzanne, you are the best. Oh, Nikki, you're too kind. <laughs> And I should say that Suzanne's got wonderful books too. Have you got a copy of The Deceptions there that you can Oh, it's not funny you should ask, Nikki, actually. <laughs> There it is! Hooray! <laughs> so that's Suzanne's wonderful, wonderful. Fine. Thank you. <laughs> I have them both.
<laughs> she's an extraordinary writer and I urge you to go to the Deceptions. And also um, thank you to Geelong Library, to the you wonderful, glorious people behind the scenes. I know you're there. Um, you've been wonderful too. Thank you for having me. I've so enjoyed this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. What fun. The Ripping Tree is published by Penguin Random House Australia. And can you... No, it's not. It's from Harper's Collins. I thought it's Fourth Estate. Let's try again. Yeah. Nikki. <laughs> the Ripping Tree is published by Fourth Estate, which is Harper Collins, of course, Catherine Mill. Sorry, Catherine. And can be purchased online from uh, Harper Collins or from any of our excellent local bookstores. Copy or copies of Nikki's books are available to borrow from the Geelong Regional Library's website in ebook format and hard copy. If you are a member of the library, you might like to take advantage of the library's new click and collect service, which you can access through the website. Thank you so much, Nikki, for joining us today. And on behalf of the library, thank you everybody on screen for being here. Good night to you all. Good night. Thank you.